title of the message is Love is a Choice. Go ahead and throw that first passage up, Nick. It says, this is Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging (laughs) cymbal. And that's loud. (laughs) You ever feel like people in your life (laughs) sound like that? (laughs) My first visual example. I'm going to really play this out. (laughs) Do you ever worry that maybe that's what you sound like to other people in your life? How can we avoid that? We have to make the choice, according to Paul, to love. Because eloquence is good and communication is good. I mean, one of our cultural values is clarity is caring, right? You have to communicate. We have to communicate. And there are some wonderful and creative ways to do it. And that's awesome. But love is better. As a matter of fact, without love, all those words, that poetic lyric and rhyming meter is just noise. And actually, it's not just noise. It's loud (laughs) noise. Right? You ever notice (laughs) where we put our drummer? Why do you think we put Eric in there? Because we want to control this sound. We don't want to let too much of it out. Because when you listen to this for too long, over and over, again, what do you think starts to happen? Eric, what starts to happen? You get tinnitus. You, you damage your ability to hear. You, you, you can't hear the bad things, and you also can't hear the good things. You can't hear any of it. Everything just becomes painful noise. And I feel like I see this in people. I try to encourage them. I try to build them up. I even see it in myself. Somebody will say something nice about me, something I'm wearing, something I said, whatever, some song we sang. And and, and I don't believe it. I don't receive it. I think, ah, they're just lying or they're just trying to be nice. They don't know, you know, what's really going on here. If you ever find yourself in that position, maybe you've just been listening to noise too long and you got to make the choice. Got to make the choice. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. So knowledge is good. Spiritual gifts and great faith are good. Understanding all, all, all of God's secret plans. How many of you would just take a few of God's secret plans? Just let me in on a couple of them. I don't even need to know about the secret plans he's doing in your lives. I don't care about those. Just the secret plans for my life. I want to know about those secret plans. That seems like that would be good. But love is better. I could be the most credentialed and accomplished in my field, achieving maximal. But without love, Paul says in that scenario, I am nothing. And if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So benevolence and all sorts of sacrificial living is good, but love is better. Furthermore, I could choose to make the very purpose of my life to give and to give and to give and to give and to give give all my time, all my talents, give, give all my treasures. I could even to the, go to the point of sacrificing my body, Paul says, which sounds a lot like John 15, 13, which is a couple messages ago where, where Jesus says, greater love has no man than this but to lay down his life. But, but what's the end? For his friends. Well, if you're just laying down your life for yourself, if you're laying down your life out of fear, if you're laying down your life out of legalism, And you've profited nothing. That's what other translations say. There's, there's no profit. It's a net zero. So you see, these things are not bad things. Eloquence, spiritual gifting, knowledge, sacrificial living, and so forth. Of course, these things are not 
bad things, they're good things. Uh, the, the whole trend of the Bible is that God made it, whatever it is, and so therefore it is good, right? Genesis, he made this, he said it was good. He made this, he said it was good. He made this, he said it was good. All the things are good. The question is, what is our motivation? How we use it, how we say it, how we post it, how we tweet it, how we text it, our hearts behind all of the things. This is what determines the quality of our action in the eyes of the Father. Are we compelled by love? Because love is best. Love is best. That's what Paul's saying here. And, and I think if we want to... Um, if we wanna get on the on-ramp at the right part on the interstate and track along with Paul, we need to back up a little bit because these verses are used out of context a lot that I'm gonna go through today in chapter 13. Most of y'all have heard them all at weddings, and yes, we should love our, our spouses like this, but this is not romantic love that, that this whole chapter is about. In chapter 12, Paul's talking about how the church should operate. Actually, he, he planted the church in Corinth, uh, and, and then he left, and it was the first church. Everywhere Paul went and planted a church, it was always the first church. There was no other church there. They did, church didn't exist. He started all the, I think that's super cool. So he went to Corinth. They didn't have a church. He's like, hey, why don't we start a church? He leaves. Well, just like every church plant, they screw stuff up. You know, they don't know what they're doing. And they don't even have like the church down the street to call and ask like, hey, what do you guys do? And such and such happens. I don't know. You know, so, so they write letters to Paul and he writes letters to them and they're going back and forth. And this letter is, is directed to the whole church, talking to them about how to operate in services, how to use spiritual gifting, how to, to treat and engage and interact with each other. So this is for all of us. And he uses this awesome analogy. If you haven't, or metaphor, I don't know. Uh, and he, if you haven't read chapter 12, he talks about how the church is like a body each member being a different part, and each part has its own unique role to play, its own special gift that God's given that part so that that part can work together with all the other parts for the benefit of the whole body. And he just, and he really, he really emphasizes how we can be unique, but we're together. We're doing these different things, but it's all for the same goal. And then he ends it and he says, except this one thing that everybody does. And in chapter 12, the very last verse, after talking about all those gifts and everything, Paul says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all, and that is the way of love. It's the choice of love, and it's something we're all called to do, and we're called to do it above and beyond our gift. Whatever God wants you to do here, he wants you to love. So love is the mission, and love is best, but what the heck is love? Look at your neighbor and say, what the heck is love? Yeah, what the heck is love? You, could look, you know what else you should do is you should look at your neighbor and you should say, I love you. You don't have to right now because that's kind of weird. We've made that weird though, church. I'm telling you, it's one of the great works of the enemy. Hey, I'm gonna get serious with you real quick. Robbing, the robbery of love is one of the great works of, of the enemy and, and particularly in men. It is not masculine to love. Somehow, somehow we have let the enemy pull the wool over our eyes on this. Just scroll down Facebook and, and click the likes and click the loves. And just, unless it's something about football or something like that, it will be primarily women who love things. Why? What is the deal? That's not in my notes, but I just want to tell you that. Don't let the enemy steal. You should be ending your conversations. I love you. Love you, bro. See you next time. I talked to Clayton on the phone. Love you, bro. I'm out. I'm leaving here in the parking lot. Love you, Ian. Peace. I'm gone. That, that's just our language. That's just how we should talk to each other. And the thing is, we don't know that we love each other, and so we have to remind each other. Like, I forget, oh yeah, I'm supposed to love you. <laughs> My bad. And then you, but you forget that I do love you. So anyhow, I already didn't have enough time to say all these things. What do we do when we don't know what love is? We say, what, what the heck is love? Like, we, we love God, and we love Bluebell ice cream, and we love our children, and we love Bucks football, and we love, you know, chicken wings. And, and so what we do when we don't know things is, what we do is we go to Google, maybe what we should consider doing just a little bit before that is going to the Bible. There's some answers there for some stuff, I think. And what we're gonna find a lot of times is that the answers we get in the Bible and the answers we get in Google are not going to line up. And you gotta know the difference. Because Google says love's an intense feeling of deep affection, a great interest and pleasure in something, to feel deep affection for someone or to like and enjoy something or someone very much. No choices involved there. There are no choices in that in those definitions that Google has to provide for us. 
And, a, and actually, when you look at that kind of stuff, it makes sense. Like, I, I understand how if it's about what I'm feeling, how I can at times love, you know, my family, and I can love my God, and then I can love, you know, an ice cream sundae because I'm affectionate about that sometimes. But, but if that's love, then, like, I also think about when I was, like, five or six or seven, I don't know, when I was in elementary school, my mom made my lunches, and she used to make me a cheese sandwich. Mm. Bread, mayonnaise, and a craft single on that bad boy. And I loved it. According to Google, at least, I loved it. But I don't anymore. Ugh, I can't even believe that I ate that. Like, I'm, I'm, my, my wife makes something similar for my kids. I'm like, oh, don't do that. Dude, give them something better. So is that love? Do we love things and then we don't love them next season and then maybe, I don't know, it'll come back around again. Maybe I'll feel it again. We treat love like that because we, we, we anchor relationships on love and then we don't feel it and so, eh, the relationships. How does this compare with the love that we see in the life and the followers of Jesus? Feelings, affections, emotions, is this the biblical language we should be using for love or have we settled for the definition of a lesser king? Thankfully, Paul continues. Anybody thankful for the Bible this morning? Come on, somebody, make some noise. He goes on in verse four, and he talks about the choices that love makes. Ready? Here we go. Buckle up. 15 things, 15 choices that love makes. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. We're going to stop there for a sec because that's a lot. That's two verses, and that is a mountain of commands right there. Love is patient. The, the definition of the Greek word used here means long-suffering. Love is long suffering. I was thinking like, isn't that just what the uh, preview for the next romance movie is? Like, love is long suffering. I'm long suffering in my love. love. I love, oh, how I love you. Let me count the ways how you make me suffer for such a long time. <laughs> what? Love is patient. Love is patient. It's hard to have love at first sight. I'm not saying it's not possible, and we're called to love people as soon as we engage and interact with them. But real love, real love to be experienced, it takes time. It's a process. It's, a, it's, it's working these things out over times and long seasons. You just, church, you cannot love in a hurry. You really can't. I mean, he, li he literally starts the list with patience. He's trying to prepare us. These things are gonna take some time. They're gonna cost us something. You cannot love in a hurry. And I wonder sometimes if you or if I, have, have I built my calendar in such a way that it's actually in opposition to the goal and the call of my life to love people? I mean, literally, that's the number one thing, the number one command. Love God, love people. But if I'm in a rush all the time, how the heck am I gonna do that? Love is patient. And also, love is kind. Love is kind, and this is not a good translation either. It is virtuous and good. That's kind of what we think of in, in the, with the word kind. But the Greek word here that's used also has another meaning that, 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 that triggers like useful or properly fit for use. We don't really have a good word to translate for this word that's used here. And so I'm just wondering, do people find you useful? Do you feel like you're useful? Because love is useful. It fits, I mean, love fits every situation. It doesn't mean that the person you're loving is gonna agree with you. Sometimes you're going to love people and they're not going to like, they're not going to like that. But it fits. It's useful. It's useful in every situation. So if you feel like maybe sometimes you're not useful to the people of your life, praise God, Paul's helping us out this morning. I feel that way too. We can be encouraged because he's keying us in here on some, some real easy avenues that we can take to become useful, to have a love that is useful to people, a love that is kind. Because love is kind. Number three, love is not jealous don't want what you don't have. We gotta work hard for this because everything out there is trying to make us jealous of something. I mean, every billboard, every commercial that comes on TV, every ad on the radio, every, everything you're clicking on, whatever you're clicking on, I don't know. It's all trying to get you to covet something, desire something that you don't have, convince you that what you do have stinks and that what that person has over there is better. But love is not jealous. Matter of fact, we could actually celebrate the favor that we see in the lives of others. Like you could go a whole next step of not, not, not wanting what they have, but actually being glad that they have it. 
That's what we're called to do as Christians. And this doesn't mean that we're not called to dream or have ambitions or set goals or work hard. But we know, we know, you know, I know the difference when I slip from, from putting my mind on building something or appreciating something and I turn the corner to coveting something or craving something that I don't have. And we have to press into the mature understanding that what we have, listen, we have to press into the mature understanding that what we have or what we don't have is not a reflection of God's sovereignty or the love that he has for you or for me. What you have or what you don't have That's not how you can measure God's love. Health, relationships, job, provision, those are not the measuring metrics that we're using to understand God's love. Because the things that God is, he always is. He's always good, he's always true, he's always faithful, he's always loving, and the things that he's not, he never will be. He'll never be dishonest, he'll never be discouraging, he'll never be mean, he'll never be inconsistent, he'll never be inattentive or unconcerned or uncaring. He'll never be those things. And because of who he is, we can live our lives honoring and saluting the blessing and the favor in the lives of those around us. Because love is not jealous and love is not boastful. Love is not boastful, uh, don't brag. Love is not boastful, don't, don't brag, except about Christ. If you're talking about something good in you, it should be pointing to Jesus. Hey, you did that well, God be the glory. Like, receive it, thank you. But it's not our job to praise ourselves. It's our job to praise God and to praise others, to build up the people around us. Like one of the, one of the main answers we got on the survey we just did was, was uh, what's troubling us or what do you want to hear? Or how do you want to be equipped to fight back? And it was um, loneliness. And I was thinking like, if you're lonely, if you're struggling with loneliness, be an encourager, build people up. Don't brag. I don't want to be around people that brag. They make me feel bad. I mean, they may be not, whatever. I don't even care who they are. Like, they make me feel bad. I, they're doing all this stuff, and I'm just over here, man, I'm just over here making a mess of things. You know, you got it all going for you. That doesn't make me feel, walk, look, walk into a room and think, I'm going to make the people in the room feel better about themselves. Not, and, and what will happen is they will feel better about you. You won't have to brag. You know what I mean? You won't, you won't need to talk about your accolades because they're just going to love the way that you make them feel because love is not boastful and love is not proud. This is the fifth thing. Ron, we're on if you're counting or taking notes. Love is not proud. Our love, there's two sides of this, so I'm going to try and communicate it clearly, but our love is not too good for other people and our love is not not good enough for people. And this side's a little bit easier, but it is pride. I mean, like, uh, they're too, you know, what can I offer? I'm nothing. I'm worthless. You know, I have, no, I have no good thing to bring to this situation. My love, they don't need that. Man, that is a lie straight from the devil. And that's also pride. It's pride. That's what it is. It's a type of self-focused pride. And then there's the, hey, man, man you're a wreck, and I'm just, I don't have time for that. Like, I got to invest my time somewhere where it's going to produce a return. You're obviously, that, that's, that's pride. You, and, and love, the kind of love that we're called to, it's not proud. It's not too good for the people in our lives. I love Paul's letter to the church in Galatia where he puts it this way. This is the only verse I'm going out of, out of Corinthians because I'm just so dialed in on this chapter 13. But I like this in Galatians 6 verse 3. Paul says, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Church, can I be real? I'm going to anyway. Somebody needs your help. Somebody needs your help right now. Maybe desperately, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. The stakes could not be higher. But if you or I are too good or too proud for the mission, and the mission is people, the mission isn't songs or messages or teaching or programs or benevolence, the mission is loving people. That's the mission. And if we're too good for it, I mean, wasn't Jesus too good for us? Didn't he leave heaven and all of whatever that is? It's better than here. Didn't he leave all that? Didn't he leave all that to come here when we were dead in sin, impossibly separated in rebellion, and as the Bible says, we were hating God? 
If there was ever anybody who was too good to love, it was Jesus. And he set that aside, and he came, and he rescued you, and he pulled you out of darkness, and he put you into his marvelous light. And we have to do the same. And it's unlikely that you are called to love a person who's actively hating you right now. But even if you are, praise God, you get an opportunity to press in and become more like Jesus. Come on, you, sh- you gotta be loving people who are you- you're not in agreement with, who you're not in alignment with. There is no gr- there's rarely a greater celebration than when you've been loving on somebody who's hating on God and they turn the corner and revelation comes and the lights come on and, and-, and they begin to experience the goodness. They taste and they see that it is good and you've got to watch it and love them through it the whole time and you're robbing yourself of this opportunity. Man, don't let the enemy do that. Love is not proud and love is not rude. In general, we don't really accept over rudeness in our society, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, we have, you know, Karens and such. Nobody wants to go viral. I feel like I should use the joke again. <laughs> it's funny to me, my mother-in-law's name is Karen. I just, I don't know why. It's like, oh man, I've been living with, I've been living with that for a long time. Um, <laughs> I love you, Karen. She loves me, and, and I love her. She sends me really nice text messages and says she's proud of me. So it's great. Um, but love is not rude, and generally we don't accept rudeness. We don't accept it here. But what about covert rudeness, sneaky rudeness? I feel like we have, uh, we've cleared out a nice little place in the living room to keep that couch. Highbrow rudeness, rudeness with finesse, savvy rudeness. It's when we profess allegiance to Christ in one conversation or social media post, and then in the next breath or thread comment, we say things like, let's go, Brandon. I begin to wonder if we have allowed ourselves to tolerate a certain kind of rudeness. But love is not rude. It's never going to bring anybody to Jesus. You're driving them away. You're driving them away from Jesus when you act like that. Love does not demand its own way. It's not self-seeking, King James Version says. Don't think of yourself first, but consider others. Nail your agenda to the cross. You can find your joy in the joy of others, meeting their needs, seeing them choose righteous living, Love doesn't demand its own way. So I feel like the church is an easy example to use. I'll, 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 I'll help Pastor Clayton out a little bit because I only come up here every once in a while. But a lot of you guys come here, um, this is just an easy example, but this is happening everywhere you go. A lot of you guys come here from other churches. And some of you come here and you're like, I hope you never do things the way that church did it. Okay. But others of you come from great churches. Maybe you moved and you know this is just where you're at now. And what... What, what we can slip into is we can, we, can, we can not make this choice, the choice to not demand our own way, and we can come in and be like, well, music in the front, I think that's, you know, we, we should make that change. Otherwise, I, you know, or, or I like the service times at this time, and, and, and I think we should change it. I'm just, I just, it's just hard, you know, nine just a little early, 10, 30, you know, like Pastor Clayton uses the joke, I need a 10, 14. Uh, you know, there, okay, here's another one. There are, there are a thousand great ministries out there that we could partner with. And, and, and maybe we could partner with every one of them and give them all a dollar, you know, and make no impact whatsoever. Or we could choose the three or four. We could pray. We could seek God and say, God, where are you leading us to partner with in our community? And we could go these couple of, of things and we could give and we could partner with them in such a way that we actually make an impact. But if everybody who comes in gets to choose the ministry that we're going to partner up with or the program that we're going to, or if everybody gets to teach or if everybody gets to sing, man, we're never going to get it done. Each person has to play their own part. And here's the thing. If you're fighting for a, for, for a God thing, if you're fighting for the way of Jesus, if you're fighting for the, 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 the majority agreed upon uh, theological uh, statutes of, of Christianity, then you're not fighting for your own way. You're fighting for God's way. So you can demand the things of Jesus. It's a careful uh, uh, 
like, what's a tightrope walk that we have to do? We have to determine, and the only way that you can know that is if you're in the word. You've got to read to know the things of Jesus, but love doesn't demand its own way. Could you imagine what it would be like here if we actually did that? If everybody who came in here was coming in thinking, even just here, just in this place, that they were going to sacrifice and give up and serve others before they serve themselves. In a room like this, what would that would mean is you would have 150 people working to serve you, and you would just be the one doing your part. Or, or you could take the other approach and say, how many people can I manipulate? How much selfishness can I have? How much can I turn everybody to come and support me? And, and, and you're still gonna lose. The kingdom way is gonna win. The kingdom way has everybody looking out for you. The kingdom way has everybody providing resources for you when you're lacking provision. The kingdom way has everybody loving you when you're, when you're not able to feel loved. The kingdom way has everything working for your benefit instead of you fighting for yourself. Because love does not demand its own way. And love is not irritable. Number eight, love is not irritable. Other, other translations say love is not easily provoked. It's very similar to patience. There's no short fuses in the kingdom. We're slow to speak. We're quick to listen. We're slow to anger. We're quick to listen. We're quick to listen. Verily, verily, Jesus would say, listen. And that's it. He'd just say, listen. Just listen. You got to do a lot of listening to catch up to Jesus. He knew everything. He was never irritable because he knew everything everybody had done. He knew all their past experiences. He knew exactly why they behaved the way they were going to do. He knew what they were going to say next out of their mouth so it couldn't irritate them, him. That would be nice. We're not like that. So what we have to do is we have to ask questions. We have to find out people's story. We have to find out where they came from. Why, why do they have these beliefs? Why do they treat people this way? Why do they have these expectations of who God is? Until you actually get that information, you're going to respond irritably because you don't know who they are. You don't know anything about them. Jesus knew it all. There's so many opportunities to show love to the people around us that we, will never, that we will never encounter if we can't avoid provocation, if we are easily provoked. So love is not irritable, and love keeps no record of being wronged. Another choice. Whew. You gotta choose this one. I mean, you got to choose it. I remember, I remember, I remember preschool. I remember this kid, Damien, in preschool. He pushed me into a filing cabinet. There's going to be an account for that. <laughs> First time I went to the, the uh, emergency room, I got stitches in my head. Man, what a punk. I remember the first time I got punched in the face. I don't know why it's the violent stuff I remember. Um, that guy's still around on Facebook and stuff, so I'm not, I, won't, I won't call him out. But uh, he got me. I remember that. I mean, I got, I got records. I got, I got it all. And I got to choose. I got to choose to get rid of that record. I got to choose to let that man be expunged. Right? There's no record. You can't search it. You can't even find it. You can't go in the database and look. It's, it's clear and free. What about this? What about if you're not, maybe you don't keep the records of the others, but you're keeping the record of your own wrongs. I met my wife when I was 15. It's a lot of time to make mistakes. It's a lot of times to not treat her the way that I should have. She loves me. She says she's not keeping any records. <laughs> but I can, I, can, I can pull that stuff up. I mean, so quick, so quick. Discourage myself. I have to make the choice. What about being a parent? I, uh, I coached my son's soccer team one season, and uh, we were having a practice, and he got upset about something. I don't, know, I don't know what he was upset about because I was upset about him being upset, and I was upset that he was making me look bad, and I was upset that I wasn't getting the performance out of him that I wanted, and I lost it, and I grabbed him and hustled him off the soccer field in the middle of practice. I didn't even say anything to the other coach. I was so, I was so angry, I went, I was trying to get in the wrong car. There's a van, looked just like my van, I was, I'm like, I'm pushing the button, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm pulling on the door handle, it's not my car. What's going on? Turn around, ah, oh, there's the car. We go over there, we get in the car, I get him in his seat. 
sit down in the I sit down in the driver's seat and I look in the rear view and he's looking back at me and he's just crying. And man, it all sunk in. I have to choose Mason. Mason, you can't keep a record of that wrong. Mason, you can't keep a record of wrong. You got to make that choice. I didn't physically hurt him, but I, I didn't love him. And I hate myself every single time I think about that. But I have to choose. I have to choose to love myself in such a way that I keep no record of being wrong. Are you struggling? Are you struggling maybe with your love manifesting for others in your life the way Jesus said it would? Because he said you have to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to... Love yourself with a kind of love that keeps no record of being wronged. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love does not rejoice about injustice. We take no pleasure, Christian, we take no pleasure to see even an adversary fall into an error or sin. When you've been infected by this kind of love, this life-transforming 1 Corinthians love that Paul is describing, a, a man or, in, or a woman influenced by this type of love is truly sorry for sin or folly, even in an enemy. We love our enemies, and we pray for those who persecute against us. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Truth substitute for Jesus. Love rejoices whenever Jesus wins out, because Jesus is the truth. Not your truth. No one cares about your truth. I'm so tired of hearing about that. I wish we would just stop saying it. Stop living your truth. Live the truth. That's a better way to go. There's only one truth. Your truth is just a lie. That's just another way of saying I'm living my lie. Like that was what we should be saying. Live the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. This is what we rejoice in. The truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God. But how will we recognize the truth when we see it? How do we know when to rejoice? We got to read the Bible. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. We got to read the Bible. We got to read the Bible because, because Jesus is the truth, and the Bible also says that Jesus was the Word made flesh. Everybody say, the Word. word. Yeah, Jesus is the Word. And you learn about what you can celebrate by reading about Him, by reading about Jesus. All right, the next three I'm going to lump together and try and move us along because I'm already. Um, not where I thought I'd be at this point in my notes. Love never gives up, never loses faith, and is always hopeful. These three things I'm kind of putting together because I think that these are instructions about the way that we see God, and, and most of what I've been leading up to is about the way that we see each other or ourselves and interact with each other. But these three are, 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 are uh, more about God. We all, in some measure, experience suffering, pain, disappointment, loss. Paul's not ignorant of that. As a matter of fact, it could be easy to argue that Paul lived in a time where following Christ actually invited all those things into your life. Like, you're just like, hey, come and cause pain for me. I follow Jesus. That is basically saying the same thing. And that, so that's not the question. Scripture is clear. Jesus said there will be trouble. But you can know, I can know, we can know in these moments that God's love hasn't given up. That he's still faithful. That he's still calling us to hold on to this hope of our future, of our eternity with Christ. Because love endures through every circumstance. Number 15. Love endures through every circumstance. People walk away from relationships, especially godly ones, way, way too soon. People leave churches way too soon. Don't leave when you get hurt. Don't leave a relationship when you get hurt. Don't leave a church when you get hurt. Come on. I mean, think about that. Like, you finally were there long enough that you got close enough to somebody that you opened yourself up. You were vulnerable about something. You, you got proximity. You got intimacy. And so they messed up. Yes, of course. We all will do that. Over and over and over again, the Bible says that. Make room for faults. Be quick to forgive, to forgive offenses, right? So when you get hurt, that's not the time to walk away. That's the time to press into the love that endures through every circumstance. You are robbing yourself of an opportunity to experience this. It's the best kind of love. It's the best kind of love. Man, when you get into some junk with somebody and it's rough and you're having to get into the ring and duke it out and you're playing by these rules, the rules of scripture, you gotta play by those rules. 
We gotta be devoted to one another in love. See, when I'm fighting it out with somebody that's a believer, then I can know they're playing by the same rules. There, 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 there's no rule that says, I'm out of here, peace. That rule doesn't exist. I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm not advocating for abusive relationships, so I'll give that caveat. But it's gonna be hard. The closer you get, the more exposed you are to have blow-ups. And guess what? Blow-ups lead to a stronger bond when you're on the other side. You're better friends. You're better comrades. You trust them more. You have more faith. You know the next time that some junk happens, you can, tr you can count on them to be there. They're not going to leave you. They're not going to ditch you. We have argued. We have argued every about almost everything in this building. <laughs> you can't find something that we haven't had. A, we have strong opinions. <laughs> We're better because of it. I know he'll be there for me. I don't have to worry about it. I know I can be honest. I don't like this. I don't understand this. Why do we do this? This seems dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Love endures through every circumstance. You're getting ready to walk away from a church. You're getting ready to walk away from a relationship. You, you, I'm talking to you. You're getting ready to walk away from your marriage. You're getting ready to walk away from your kids. You're getting ready to walk away from your career. You're called to love with a love that endures through every circumstance. Make the choice. Make the choice today. This is for your benefit. All this stuff is set up so that you can experience the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. This is a love so great that Paul takes these next six verses to just, I mean, he just blows up. I'm going to try and get through it, but I'm already out of breath because I'm pretty excited up here. Verse eight, he says, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. What kind of love? This kind of love that we're talking about. The kind love, the patient love, the not jealous love, the not boastful love, the not proud love, the not rude love, the love that doesn't demand its own way and isn't irritable. This kind of love, when you get involved with this kind of love, baby, this lasts forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only a part of the whole picture, but when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things he says will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And this is how that works, and this is why. It's by the grace of God and through your faith that you get to experience the eternal joy of living with and knowing God, and that will never end, okay? So because of your faith, you get to walk into eternity. And here on earth, we are commanded to hold on to the hope. That's what the New Testament says about our hope. We are hold on to the hope that he's called us to, which is the hope of being in Jesus' presence forever, for eternity. But eventually, when the perfect comes, or when you go, we go, you know, uh, then, then we'll actually live in that hope. We will live in, the, we won't have to hope for being in his presence. We will be in his presence. Praise God. And somebody say amen. We will move past the hoping for his presence and actually experience it. But our love for God, our love, listen, our love for God and our love for each other, these things will last forever. Our love, for, our, our love for God and our love for each other, and these, this is displayed in our response of obedience to his word and what he's called us to. That's, that's what the Bible says about love. Those who love me obey my commands. So our, our obedience to his word, living our lives in worship will never end. Loving God and being loved by him will be an everlasting expression that is never exhausted. Come on, man, that is exciting. Band, you guys can come on up. And maybe you're here today and you're thinking, Pastor Mason, that sounds nice. I hear you, but that just hasn't been my life. It sounds good, but no one has ever loved me like that. Love for me has always ended in pain, disappointment, heartache, and regret. And to you, I would say this is exactly why Jesus deserves your loyalty, your worship, and your praise. Because when it comes down to it, when it comes to love, Jesus is supreme. No one will ever love you or me the way that Jesus loved us. But you see, that's just one more choice that you have to make.
Some of you probably felt it even before you walked in the doors this morning. Something is going to be different today. I'm done with something. I'm done with that. I don't know what I don't know what's next, but I'm done with this. I'm starting something new. You think you came here because a friend invited you? You think you came here because you you clicked an ad on a website? There's a whole unseen world. God is at work. He is orchestrating every appointment. And he's booked you now, today. And if you don't know what this love is like, then I I have to assume that you haven't opened yourself up to experience the love of Christ. And I want to invite you, start now. We don't have to wait for a song. We we, We could have started off the whole service with this and just skipped the whole message. Who wants to love Jesus today? Who wants to love Jesus today for the first time? Who wants to love Jesus today again? Who wants to do that? Man, don't wait. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Would you pray with me? Would you join us? Everlasting. To everlasting. If, you, if that's you, and I'm praying it is, I'm believing it is, I would, I would just say, Repeat after me. The the prayer should sound something like this. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you paid my debt. Jesus, I want to live with you forever. Amen. For the rest of us, I mean, the whole title of the message is the choice of love. The choice of love. So as I invite you to stand and prepare your communion elements, which I would like for you guys to take on your your own, okay? I'm going to give you a minute and some instructions on how to do that. But love is a choice. And all 15 choices that Paul outlines are up on the screen behind me. And I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is calling you to one, some of these. I believe the Holy Spirit is calling you to a particular person. So I just would ask, would you take a minute, would you prepare your heart, would you pray, would you ask and seek God? Where is Have I been waiting for the feelings of love where I need to be making the choices of love? We remember as we take it that Jesus lived and loved in a supernatural way. And because of that, I can make the choice to live a life loving my God, myself, and those around me in the same miraculous way. When you've taken a minute and you're prepared, go ahead and take your communion and let's respond in some worship.